Thank you very much. Hi, Justin. Bill Bradford from the Seattle Neighborhood Coalition. Successful urban planning targets helps target where jobs and housing development occurs while ensuring necessary transportation infrastructure and public amenities to support these. In the past, we called this the urban village strategy. Seattle has seen explosive growth fueled by tax and other incentives provided by the city. Rather than managing growth, we are encouraging unfettered demand on housing and infrastructure and have arguably failed at implementing successful housing and transportation policies because we are clearly delivering too little, too late, to support this job growth. Planning Director Sam Acefa has called Mayor Murray the Planner-in-Chief, and that planning has largely been based on a backroom deal to up some large swaths of the city called the Grand Bargain, and to support transit infrastructure which delivers mass transit to limited parts of the city decades out. What would you do different as Planner-in-Chief to address the growing pains we are experiencing? So I would build on what Mayor Murray has done around HALA and the the, uh, densi the the increasing density in certain parts of the city. I think I've talked a little bit about some of the nuances that I would add, so I'm not going to go over that again. But for example, we need to speed up delivery of sound transit to the west side of the city. We have light rail now through the southeast and it's coming up through the northeast and it is truly transformational to have that kind of access downtown. So there are things that we can do to speed up light rail. For example, there will be an EIS process. If we can figure out a political consensus on the alignment before going through that EIS process, that can shave off years of that process. Another one is local permitting and state permitting. If we can get some agreements and uh, some commitments to permitting in certain time frames, that really matters. Another piece around that, though, is that Seattle has to maintain control over where our um, over where the stations actually end up being. I think Husky Stadium Station is a really good example of a compromise that was made to keep the project moving, but from a transportation standpoint, I mean, hey, on game day, it's great and we love it, but on the other hand, there's no dense, mixed-use housing around it, right? And so we need to really make sure as we're citing light rail, more light rail, that we're learning from what we've done in the past, and that's really important. Um, there are other things that we can do around delivering transportation investments more quickly. So, for example, as we are bringing on more light rail nodes, we need to make sure that we're getting people to and from those nodes quickly. One of the commutes that, or one of the cross-town um, options, that, or one of the cross-town traveling routes that's the worst is lower Queen Anne to uh, Capitol Hill or to the freeway, right? And I would actually argue that the monorail, speaking of a throwback, could be infrastructure that we use more uh, efficiently. That should be ORCA compliant. You should be able to get off a rapid ride bus in Lower Queen Anne, take the monorail, and then get on, um, get on light rail to be able to tra traverse the city. That's one example. So I think that there are different things that we can do as mayor. I would really make a focus. And I think one thing that distinguishes me from other candidates is that I have been living and breathing these issues for my career and have the expertise and the track record on delivering on this stuff. Um, so I, I appreciate your statement about the alignment, for example, you know, where, where Sound Transit has made its choices. Your organization, Transportation Choice, has been a cheerleader for things like delivery of ST3 a couple of decades out and billions of dollars. I think the average homeowner will pay about $18,000 in taxes towards ST3 you know, to be able to take the light rail up to Everett. So I don't see how that necessarily helps us, but I appreciate that you're going to focus on that. Um, I have a question about I do support your, it. I, I, I have a question about the MHA, the blanket up zones. How does that, you know, that is a predefined zoning decision. The mayor has said, for example, all single family within urban villages is to be up zoned. Here in the central area, the remaining pockets of the black community are in these areas targeted for up zoning. So uh, the community has asked to protect those um, are you willing to compromise with communities and to help them, let them help identify where growth is? And will you also tell them how much growth they should take? Back in when you did the original neighborhood planning, neighbors were told you need to take 500 households, we need 1,000 households. Instead, we have this vague up zone everywhere solution. If it sounds like you support that, that doesn't sound like urban planning to me. So let me, let me, how many people have actually read the draft EIS on the MHA? MHA. Been out Good for job. Two days. It's been out for two days. I thought you said what keeps me up at night. I read that topic. late at night. <laughs> that keeps me up at night. What keeps me up at night? I read that late at night. That keeps me up at night. So. Let me, so let me answer that. So what's interesting about the MHA draft EIS is that it really puts forth two different ways of doing densification. One 
has a much more, I would say, traditional, let's focus it in growth. You probably use the word blanket. I wouldn't say that exactly, but, uh -oh. but urban center. Uh-oh, did we lose power? We can, it's a Muslim. can you hear me? It's a Muslim. Okay. It's a Muslim there. Good. Okay. So, um, so it's cooler that way. It's a warm day. Um, so, so the MHA, MHA has two different, uh, two different alternatives. There's a no build or a, you know, a, but, but one is really focused on I think what we're we're imagining in our heads as the MHA plan being, and then the other one actually focuses on a lower displacement strategy. And I think that that's something that we should weigh in on if that's something that you're concerned about. I think that there's some really interesting pieces to that. There was something else that you added in your question. I really wanted to get to it and I didn't because I forget what it was. Do you remember what it was? Anyway, I mean the bottom line to me is that there is an EIS process. There is a draft EIS that is out and there are two really different ways in that EIS of doing, oh, would, it, would I be willing to be in dialogue with community? Absolutely yes because we, because like I said, everyone here cares deeply about their community and that to me my sense of environmentalism and activism comes from that place-based sense of community, and so we absolutely have to be in dialogue. And there are ways to um, accommodate the MHA plans and also accommodate what communities need.